Hey everyone, welcome to seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Luis Roca from the California Academy of Sciences. It's a little bit about uh, Luis's background. He's from Brazil, I take it, from looking at his CV, and he did his undergraduate and master's degree uh, in Brazil at the Universidade de Federal de Paraíba or something like that. Paraíba? Something Maybe like that. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> getting close. My first attempt at speaking Portuguese. Uh, and then after that, he did his PhD at the University of Florida. I so saw he finished his PhD in four years. So basically the same amount of time it takes our students to finish their master's degree. So that's, that's, that's because that's how long my scholarship lasted. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah. I was out of money. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my students. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, so then after he finished his PhD, he, went, uh, he did a postdoc with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. So he was there for three years. Then he went to Hawaii, hung out for another three years or so. And then he became uh, assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin. So he did that for about three years. So I'm seeing this sort of three years, three years, three yeah, years. And yeah. then he decided Texas is probably hot and there's too many Republicans around. So True. let's escape back to the coast. And True. since 2011, he's been a curator at the California Academy of Sciences and the, the main ethologist there. And most of his research has been looking at uh, evolutionary relationships and speciation of fishes, primarily coral reef fishes. Um, uh, I was looking at his CV, he's you know, 60, 70 papers, he's described 15 to 20 new species of fish, uh, uh, you know, 50, 60, 70 expeditions all over the planet, and uh, I remember a couple of months ago I was reading the Dan Diving Magazine and they were describing this group that was doing some technical diving to about 500 feet deep off the Philippines with rebreathers to collect fishes. And it was Luis and his group, and I was like, man, these guys are hardcore <laughs> badasses. And I think he's going to be telling us about some of that work today. And so, yeah, the title of this talk, Genomics and Speciation, Cory Fishes. So. All right, thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks for having me. I've been around close to here a lot. I come visit Giacomo a lot at Santa Cruz, and I come to Monterey a lot, but I've never stopped here. I think I drove by many times, but I've never stopped. So. Thanks for the invitation, it's great to be here. Um, uh, just to give you a little background of my, my talk, so I'll, I'll start talking about genomics and speciation. Uh, that's probably gonna be two thirds of the talk and in the last third I'll talk exactly about that, about those deep dives and, uh, and uh, the novelty that we're finding down there and how important they, they seem to be for us. All right, so uh, before I jump in, and I think judging from the audience here, this is probably not gonna be news to anybody, but I have this in, in, in a lot of my talks, is it, um, it's, it's important background information. So all of those fish that I work on, uh, they are really sedentary when they are adults. So on the right side here, you have the adult uh, uh, stages, uh, snappers, uh, butterfly fish, wrasses, parrotfishes. They're all very sedentary when they're adults. They have a very relatively small uh, home range and their pelagic level stage is the dispersive phase. So it's the phase when they disperse, when they move more than, than a few kilometers or so. So when they're adults, it's the home range is between a few hundred meters to a kilometer or so. And when they're larvae, that's what they phase when they, they, disperse, uh, uh, they disperse long distances. And that's very important evolutionarily and, uh, and uh, uh, to find out more about their biogeography and how they diversify, which is the main, the main subject of the talk. So the other uh, little background information that I give is this one, and I, just to, to make sure that everybody in the audience knows what I'm talking about when I'm talking about speciation and the terms, and the terms behind it. Um, so there's basically three main modes of speciation, allopatric, pelopatric, and sympatric, and those have to do with the geographical context of, uh, of, uh, of speciation. So if you think of this graph uh, from going from the top to the bottom, so the time starts here and then it progresses as we go down to the bottom, and everything here starts as one population, so the circle represents one population. In allopatric speciation, at some point in time, that one population gets divided by two by an, an external barrier, a barrier that is not intrinsic to the species, but it's extrinsic. Um, as time passes, uh, the, the two populations that are separated by the barrier, because of the lack of gene flow, because of the lack of dispersal, so now you see how the, the larval dispersal comes in. So because of the lack of dispersal, those two populations, they become different, uh, represented by the different colors here, green and, and yellow. And then as more time passes, that barrier may uh, come down at some point, and those two populations now differentiated in species might come back into contact, and uh, depending on how differentiated they are, they might not mix again, which is represented by the solid lines here. So this represents two 
different species that are reproductively isolated and, uh, uh, and have a, a relatively small uh, overlapping range. So that's the allopatric uh, uh, mode of speciation, and that's the most uh, straightforward mode, that's the most accepted mode, uh, simply because from a modeling, from a population genetics point of view, it's very easy to understand. So when you have isolation and you stop uh, gene flow, uh, it's obvious that the two populations, they're either going to adapt to the two different uh, environments that are on either side of the barrier, or they're just going to drift apart with time and then become two different uh, species. The other two modes are a little bit more uh, problematic, a little bit more uh, uh, contentious, just because they don't require the complete separation that uh, allopatric speciation does. So in parapatric speciation, you can see here that instead of you having, uh, in the first step, two populations divided by a barrier, you just have that central population that invades a different habitat or ex ex expands its range into a different habitat. And this, in this case, what is required is that the species recognizes those two areas as different habitats to adapt to them. So differential uh, adaptation is what's going to drive differentiation in those two populations. And eventually, they'll become two different units, much like what happened with, uh, with allopatric speciation. Now, sympatric speciation doesn't even require that uh, this, this population here expands its range or, or, become, or goes to a adjacent area, like in parapatric speciation. So in sympatric speciation, the, the, the differential adaptation might be completely within the normal range of a species. And this is the most uh, uh, problematic of all modes from a modeling and population genetics perspective, and the one that people uh, tend to accept the least. So from acceptance, I would say this is the most accepted one, and that's the, the medium one, and that's the, the, the least accepted mode of speciation. And the problem here um, is that most of the time, what we find in nature when we look at speciation mode is this, is the end result. So it's two species that are over, have some certain degree of overlapping range, and they're very similar to one another. And we can't tell which process, which of these two, three processes gave rise to those, to those species. It doesn't matter how much evidence I have that it was sympatric speciation. So if I have something like this, and the two species have completely different habitats, and I say that it was sympatric speciation, people are going to turn back to me and they say, no, no, it's going to be allopatric speciation, and then they just came back together by secondary contact. So when you, have, when you are at this stage of speciation, it's really hard to say that it was either one of those two cages, cases, because everybody assumes that uh, allopatric speciation is the more straightforward mode, so it's the one that is driving, even though if, there's, if I find no uh, evidence at all for allopatric speciation, so if I find no geological record of any barrier or anything, People still assume that it's allopatric speciation. So it's a null hypothesis, and it's a null hypothesis that it's very hard to reject. So um, uh, basically, allopatric would be the mode in isolation, and, uh, and either parapatric or sympatric would be the modes with gene flow. And either one of those modes, or allopatric, parapatric, or sympatric, they could be what we call ecological speciation. So even allopatric speciation could be driven by differential adaptation. It could be driven by drift, but also by differential adaptation. And when it's driven by adaptation, we call it ecological, regardless of the geographical context of it. All right, so we know about speciation. We know about larval dispersal. So why, why do I study speciation? Why do I study those evolutionary problems in, in, in reef fishes and not in Drosophila, for example, which is very, very boring, uh, to say the least. But uh, I think for me, the main reason is, is, is this one, uh, diversity in coral reef fishes. It's something, nothing short of spectacular. Not only coral reef fishes, but coral reefs in general. And every organism that inhabits, every taxon, every taxonomic group that inhabits reefs, it's disproportionately more diverse in reefs than anywhere else in the oceans. So for fishes, uh, reefs, they cover about a tenth of 1% of the surface of the oceans, but we find about one third of all marine species that are only found in reefs. So we have six, 7,000 species of, of, of fishes that are only found in 0.1% uh, of the oceans. The other 99.9% .9 of the oceans, they have only, or only maybe 12,000 species or so, which is only twice as much as reefs do. So it's very disproportionately diverse. And um, there are very few barriers um, uh, that would cause allopatric speciation. So that brings an interesting conundrum. We have that. Uh, Pelagic level stage, and we have these very diverse systems, but we have very few barriers. 
So these are uh, some of the, the more uh, uh, known about, the more uh, known about barriers. This one is the East Pacific barrier. So as I said, you have that relatively long pelagic larval stage, the, diverse, the dispersal stage of reef fishes. But in some cases, those, that larval stage is not long enough to traverse four or 5,000 kilometers of open water. And that's the case here for the East Pacific barrier. So the last islands in, this, in the Pacific, Hawaii up here, French Polynesia down here, Easter Island down here, they're about 4,000, three and a half, 4,000 kilometers from the, the East Pacific, which is the next uh, tropical coral reef area. Now that distance is so far that even having that pelagic larval stage that in some, species, in some species is as long as 30, 40, 50, in some species up to 100 days or so, even with that long pelagic larval stage, they can't traverse, traverse that much uh, open water. That's the same principle that operates in the, mid, the, central, the central Atlantic, in the middle of the Atlantic, so the distance between Brazil and Africa is too far for most larvae to cross. The other barriers here, the Isthmus of Panama is a very well-known barrier um, that formed when uh, uh, Central America uplifted and, and South America collided with it, and then just formed a land bridge that separated the Caribbean and the East Pacific. Uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about when exactly that happened, but we know that it did happen. It did split a lot of species into allopatric pairs, one in either side of the barrier, and we will go back to that in a little bit. And then we have the Amazon barrier here, which is the first one that I studied in, in a lot of detail that separates Caribbean and Brazil. So just to give you a little bit of my background, when I started doing uh, 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 biology school, actually I was a diver before I became a biologist, so I did my first open water certification when I was 14 or so. And uh, when I started college, the first thing I did was look for some sort of project that I could do while I was diving. And the easiest one to do at the time was to do transects and count fish, so do community surveys of reef fishes off of my hometown in Brazil. And the only guides, the only field guides for fishes for Brazil, even to this date, are the ones that are based on fishes of the Caribbean. And, uh, and back then, everybody thought that the, the Brazilian fish were the same as the Caribbean fish. And when you look at the, the field guide and you look underwater at the fish, they look very different color-wise, especially uh, color. Um, and I was convinced that those species from Brazil were not the same as the ones from the Caribbean, and that's what brought me to do my PhD in the States, because there was nobody doing genetics in Brazil at the time, and, and I couldn't think of any other tool that I could use to prove that those species were different. So I came to, to do my PhD uh, in Florida using genetics, a tool that wasn't available at the time in Brazil. Uh, these other barriers, the Benguela, so the Amazon and the Benguela barrier, both of them are what we call uh, ecological barriers, so they're not really a physical barrier. Larvae can still cross them, but not only the habitats on both sides of these barriers are very different, but the barrier itself, in the case of the Amazon, is fresh water and sediments that really don't allow the formation of corals or survival for a lot of the larvae. And uh, the Benguela barrier is cold water upwelling of a current that comes from the Antarctic, and there's upwells here, and it kills a lot of the larvae that are coming into the, from the Indian Ocean into the Atlantic. The Old World barrier is an analog to the, to the uh, Isthmus of Panama, so another land bridge that formed. And the Sunda Shelf barrier here, it's uh, shallow water that connects all of those islands here. When the sea level drops, all of that, uh, those connections, they become land bridges, and then it slows the flow between the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, and if you slow the flow of water, you also slow the flow of larvae, so that causes a lot of difference to uh, be apparent, apparent between the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. So only five or six barriers, 6,000 species, how is that remotely possible to have that much diversity when you apparently have very few uh, opportunities for allopatric speciation? So that's the main theme around my, my, uh, my research. And we use, we go after a lot of species in a lot of places, and we use the most interesting cases that we can find to test hypotheses related to speciation and evolution in biology, instead of doing it with Drosophila in the lab. Um, so one of the interesting ones that we did was the surgeon fish, Acanturus olivaceus. It has a 60-day pelagic larval stage. So the blue here uh, uh, indicates the range of this species, Acanturus olivaceus. And then the red indicates the range of this guy here, Echanturus reversus. Echanturus olivaceus was a species that, uh, uh, is a species that was, was known for a long time. It's very well studied. And this one from the Marquesas, so the red dot here is the, archi the Marquesas archipelago, uh, was described relatively recently in the late 90s based on color only. Uh, the only difference 
the only apparent difference between them is the color. So this one has a, a lot less orange in this orange band behind the eye, and it has the yellow tail with the black margin, and this one has the black tail with the white margin. Um, that's why they're called reverses. It's the reversed color of the tail from one species to the other. Um, um, as I said, the main difference is color. So all of the morphology, uh, the morphological characters, they overlap between the species. So that was a, a prime case to look, prime case to look at, uh, to look at uh, not only why are they different or why are they different color-wise, but also um, why they, they separated at all. Because the Marquesas, if you remember, if we go back to that slide with the uh, barriers here, there's no apparent barrier. So Marquesas is this archipelago here, and it's very close to the rest of French Polynesia. So there's no apparent barrier between the Marquesas and French Polynesia. But geographically, they're very close. So theoretically, larvae could flow from one place to the other. So here we are again in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, this is the main uh, entire Indo-Pacific archipelago. The Marquesas is right here. Hawaii up here, Easter Island. So there's three main areas of high endemism in the Pacific. And these are Hawaii, Easter Island, and the Marquesas. So for Hawaii and Easter Island, you can clearly see that there's more than 1,000 kilometers between that and the main archipelagos, the main islands of the Pacific. But Mar the Marquesas is relatively close. They're only 400 kilometers from the nearest major reef formation in French Polynesia. And if you go from anywhere in French Polynesia here, there's less than 1% endemism. Uh, in the Marquesas, it's 15% endemism. So a lot of endemic species in the Marquesas, not only of fish, but also invertebrates and, uh, and corals and, and other taxa. Hawaii is the highest endemism in the Pacific at about 24% or so, and uh, Easter Island is about 19% endemism. So of all of the Pacific archipelagos, the only three archipelagos that have been more than 2% endemism are those three here, Hawaii, Marquesas, and Easter. Now, for Hawaii and the Marquesas, it's obvious that it's isolation. But for, for Hawaii and Easter, it's obvious that it's, it's isolation. But for the Marquesas, we're just not sure. So one thing that is very interesting about the Marquesas, and it contrasts it a lot with the other reefs in the South Pacific, is that most reefs in the South Pacific are like this. So this is a typical atoll in French Polynesia. This one happens to be Bora Bora. Uh, very clear water, a lot of coral development, oligotrophic water, blue water, uh, a lot of reef growing, a lot of diversity. And then when you get to the Marquesas, um, it's a very different picture. There's not as much coral growth there. The islands, geologically, they're much younger. So most islands in, uh, in French Polynesia, they are uh, older than 25, 30 million years. The Marquesas, the whole archipelago is about 5 million years old. So geologically, the islands are a lot younger. There's a lot more sediment on top of them. They are in an area where it rains quite a bit more than in, in when compared to those other uh, archipelagos in French Polynesia. And there's some upwelling there also. So combine the upwelling with the rain and the nutrients that rain down from the geologically young islands that are still being eroded away, and you get green water with a lot of nutrients. Uh, and mm -hmm. it makes the, the habitat in general uh, very different from those other, from those other uh, South Pacific islands. So that made us ask, uh, what well, is that uh, what's driving um, speciation in this particular case and in other cases of endemism. And this is what's causing the high, endemisms at, the high endemism at the Marquesas. So back in 2002 or so, we, uh, we used the tools that we had at the time and we looked at mitochondrial DNA and, and nuclear DNA for the two species, for Acanthurus olivaceus, this one that is the widespread uh, Indo-Pacific species, and for Acanthurus reversus, that is the Marquesas one. Um, and uh, we found almost no difference between them. So if you haven't seen this before, this is a haplotype network. Every circle here represents a, a sequence of DNA. And if you have one circle connected to it, that means that this little green circle here is connected to the, green, the, 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 the big uh, circle by one mutation. So these other haplotypes are just one mutation away. They're very close to one another. And the size of the circle uh, represents how many individuals have that exact same DNA sequence, that ha exact same haplotype. So a lot of individuals that have this, have this haplotype, a lot of individuals that have this haplotype, only one fish has this one, only one has this one, this one is shared by two or three or so, this one is by 50 or so. So the bigger the circle, the more individuals have that haplotype, and the connections indicate here that everything is close together, and the colors, they code for the geographic areas. 
So what, what I'm showing here is that a lot of different locations share this haplotype. A lot of different locations share this haplotype. So we go from island to island to island, and we find the exact same DNA haplotype. Even the Marquesas, which is red here, is the same. And it's a little, Marquesas is a little bit different in, in terms of uh, mitochondrial DNA, which is this gene here. But when you look at nuclear DNA, every major haplotype is represented in all of the locations. So apparently, looking at those genes here, there's not much difference between the locations. So when we did, when we put the numbers behind that, it was striking for us to see that the population at Hawaii, which is the one that is isolated geographically, had a higher FST, so it had a higher measure of genetic differentiation from the Central Pacific than the reverses did, which is the one that has the name and has the, uh, uh, the color differences and is in that place that theoretically is very different environmentally, very, very different, very differently and should be causing um, adaptation in that case. So that puzzled us for a long time. And we kind of hit a wall there for a while because we didn't have any other tools that we could use at the time. Now that was back in 2002 or so. So just to summarize that, yeah, that's the difference. So the difference between Hawaii and, uh, and the Central Pacific, which is about 800 to 1,000 kilometers here, was higher than the difference from Marquesas in the Central Pacific, which is much closer. Um, so that was back in 2002, but what we did, uh, well, we, as everybody knows, the, the technology progressed in an unprecedented way. 2002 was when the first human genome was published. Uh, that first genome cost about uh, $2.5 billion to sequence. Today you can sequence a whole genome, a whole human genome, for less than $10,000. Um, so now we can use much more advanced techniques to look at the same problems. Um, and what we use in this case, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, it's very methodology heavy, but I can talk to anybody uh, after the, the talk if you're interested in the methods that we're using. Uh, but suffice to say, what we used was a, a reduced representation of the genome. So we, we chopped up the genome in several thousands, different thousands of different parts, and we sequenced the same region for all of the individuals that we had. So now instead of having those three genes that we looked at in the first analysis, we came up to with, with 5,000 or so. Uh, and now we, all of a sudden we have much more resolving power to, to, to address um, our questions. It's not the holy grail of anything. Uh, uh, because it's so much data, we can't even see the data. So everything has to be uh, treated, looking at, I mean, using scripts and programming. So it's not, it's not very easy to do with the data. Uh, storage, I get yelled at by IT all the time because I keep uploading terabytes and terabytes of data. And then every time I want to reanalyze the data, I have to duplicate my data set. And then I have, all of a sudden, I have 10 copies of an 8 terabyte data set. I and mean, people were not very happy with me. but. Uh, uh, what can you do? As long as we get results that are like this in the end, it's really nice. So um, uh, if you go back to that, that first data set that I show you with the three haplotype networks, every one of those haplotype networks was giving me as much information as one of the dots in this graph here. So now instead of having three dots in the graph, I have 5,086. So we did a, a, a sequencing of 5,086 random pieces across the genome. We used restriction enzymes, and so theoretically they are uh, relatively evenly spaced throughout the genome and represented across the entire genome, so we know we have a good representation of the whole genome. And what this, this program did here was it compared the, the genetic differentiation between populations for every one of those 5,000 loci, and it plotted it against a background variation of FSTs. So it called that background variation what would be expected and then anything above that red line here is significantly different than the expected. So those are uh, outliers. So one of the reasons for them to be outliers is if they're close to or if they are actually a, a locus that is being selected for. And then if you're under this other red line here, it's because you're too slow. And this is kind of expected because a lot of genes, they can't really change. You can't change the genes that uh, code for the architecture of the, the binding of the DNA. So there's a lot of genes in, in a, across several species that can't really change. They're slower than what the background variation is. But there's not, there shouldn't be a lot that are above the background variation. Uh, um, only in cases where they're being selected for. And, uh, and, and a few other examples, but most of the, for the most part, is, is big selection that is driving this differentiation here. So that was interesting and, and surprising at the same time. 
and those were 57, so about 1% of the, the 5,000 or so loci that we sequenced, 57 were in the selection. Now, this is just a different uh, representation of that same uh, data set. Uh, this is uh, structure plots, and those are all uh, six populations here going from uh, left to right. This is Hawaii, uh, Kiribati, Christmas Island, uh, Palau, Marshall Islands, uh, Bali, and the Marquesas is the last population here. So what we were not finding when we looked at all, the entire data set, the neutral loci, and those are under balanced selection, we're, we're not finding any population that was sticking out. This is a, a principal correspondence analysis that also does about the same thing. So the different colors here in the graph show the different comparisons between the different uh, uh, populations. And as you can see from the mixed colors here, no one population stands out. But when we did those same two analyses with the, uh, the, the, those 57 loci that are under, theoretically under selection, the Marquesas population, which is number six here, popped out in both of the analyses. So it popped out in the structure analysis and it popped out in the PCA analysis, which is the brown here. So it's completely different in both types of analysis. And what that tells us is that those 57 genes, they are not only different, but they are different in that particular population, which is the Marquesas, which is the one that we thought that we suspected was under selection. So here is where it gets really interesting. Um, so we got those 57 genes, and uh, we, looked, we went back to them, and we looked at all of the sequences, and uh, we blasted them. So we blasted them against this, this large genomic data set online. It's free. You can just get any sequence. You put it online there, and the, the database will tell you which, what, uh, what's the closest match to that particular locus. So for one of those locus, loci, apparently, I mean, amazingly enough, one of them matched uh, rhodopsin which is a visual uh, pigment uh, uh, gene that is involved in, uh, in, uh, in selection in a lot of cases when there's differences in the water color. So fish change that gene depending on, on or what well, the selection pressure changes depending on what the water is. And then it pushes the gene to, to differentiate to be, for the fish to be able to see better in that type of that color water. Uh, and as you go, if you go back to what I said about the differences between habitat between those islands, the, the, the Central Pacific waters are really clear, really blue waters. Marquesas is high nutrient, almost the waters like here, I mean, high nutrient, green type water, never as clear as, uh, as the other locations. Now the other thing too is that the color of the fish are different, not only the color of the, the water, but the color of the fish. So it might have something to do also with the, the you being able to locate your, your mate easier if you change the color receptors in your eyes. So all kinds of interesting speculations that we can do about that. Um, so this gene was already implicated uh, uh, as being under selection in several different other cases, so it was not unique be, uh, of that. And it was nice to see this because we were also, I mean, it was made it easier for us to explain that this was one of the genes that was relating, was causing divergence in that case. Uh, because it was identified to be causing divergence in, in several different other cases. Uh, this work was already published recently, maybe two, three months ago in molecular ecology, and if you want a reprint, we can, we can send it to you easy, no problem. Uh, this one is, uh, is the project of one of my PhD students that is not published yet. He's defending his thesis in two weeks when I come back from Vanuatu. So um, it's a different group, so we're moving now from the Indo-Pacific to the Atlantic and the East Pacific. Uh, this group uh, is the genus Himilon, and their common name is Grunts. Uh, they are uh, very common. We find them in large numbers when you find them in the reef. There's about 19 species, so it's a relatively low diversity genus. They're commercially important because they're so abundant and they're good to eat. Uh, they attain very large biomasses, they have very large schools, and they have a relatively short pelagic level stage. That's probably why they're not in the Pacific, they're only in the Atlantic. There's a little group that only evolved uh, in the Atlantic and the East Pacific. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning with the slide with the, about the biogeography, one of the, the barriers that we know a lot about is the, uh, the Isthmus of Panama. So this just represents, again, uh, the, the closure of the Isthmus of Panama, and it just slowly closed. Uh, with time, within, well, we started closing about 15 million years ago, and it completely closed at about 3 million years ago. There's some evidence that suggests that was a short closure at about 7 million years ago, and then it reopened, and then it completely closed again at 3 million years ago. But regardless, 
it is a barrier that, that did close, and it formed those sibling species. So the top species here is the Pacific species, the bottom is the Atlantic one, the top is the Pacific, the bottom is the Atlantic one. So it formed those obvious sibling, those obvious sister species that were formed probably because of the closure of that particular barrier. So with that in mind, since we had 19 species in that genus and about half of them were in the Atlantic and half of them were in the Pacific, we thought, oh, let's do a phylogeny of these genus. And when we look at their relationship genetically, we're probably going to find a lot of sister species that are separated by the isthmus of Panama, so one in each side of that barrier. Uh, we found nothing like that. Um, so uh, this is the, phylo the mitochondrial phylogeny. This is the nuclear DNA phylogeny. Again, the closer you are in the branches here, the closer your, your uh, DNA sequences are. And uh, shaded in red here is the only pair that seems to have been separated by the isthmus of Panama. All of these other pairs shaded in blue, they are sympatric. So they have almost the exact same geographic distribution. So these two are both in the Pacific, these two are both in the Atlantic, both in the Atlantic, both in the Pacific, both in the Atlantic all in the Atlantic, all in the Pacific. So it's, it's, it's a mix and match, but they're always in the same area. They're, it's the complete opposite that we expected. We expected to find this signal with a lot of pairs of species, but always them being separated by the isthmus of Panama. And that's not the case, which was very interesting and surprising. Uh, so we decided to investigate that a little further in a couple of particular cases. This one is a pair of uh, Himilon maculicauda and Flavio Gutatum. Uh, the, the graph on the bottom here that represents their geographic distribution. So Maculicauda goes a little bit further south than Flavigutatum, and we're even finding Flavigutatum f even further south, so it seems like they have even, an even closer distribution than we thought before. But they have almost 100% range overlap. And they are, if you go back to the map here, they are each other's closest relatives. So that's Maculicauda on the top here, Flavigutatum. That's the uh, nuclear DNA tree, and that's the mitochondrial DNA up here. That's Flavigutato and Maculicaldo. So they're in both trees, they're closely related. There's no question that they are each other's closest relatives, yet they have this exact same distribution. Um, so what we did was that same type of analysis that we did before with those hundreds of loci or so, we did with this guy. And we also did with this pair here, which is the one pair that was separated by that we know that was separated by the isthmus of Panama. So we have one in the Pacific side, one in the Atlantic side. And in this case, they even still have the same species name uh, because morphologically, nobody can tell them apart. The color, even the color is the same. Genetically, they are different. And that difference, if you apply a molecular clock uh, to it, that difference comes down to about 3 million years, which is that point when the, the barrier closed. Uh, but because there's no morphological difference, nobody thought of putting them a different name on them. So they're still called the same thing, and I'm just uh, differentiating here by calling one Atlantic, the other one Pacific, but I still call, both of them are still called Himilon stendachneri. So here they are, that's the Flavigutato maculicauda pair, that's the stendachneri Caribbean and stendachneri Pacific pair. Um, again, we did the same analysis with about 5,000 loci, 5,000 markers. This is a slightly different type of analysis. So in that other analysis, we had the, the big background variation on the bottom. And above that red line on the bottom, we had uh, the, the genes that were being selected. Uh, in this one, whatever is to the right of this, of this line here is what's being selected. And this test is a lot more strict than that other test. So in this case, we only found seven loci that were apparently under selection. And we found that wide range, and here in the middle is a lot of those, that neutral background variation. And then the other pair, the allopatric pair, which I'm using only one photo here because they're identical on both sides of the isthmus of Panama, um, not only it didn't, well, I don't have that red line here because it didn't even reach the red line, but you can put this entire variation here with the same 5,000 loci in this area in the graph here. So if you look at the scale here, this is between 0 0.05 to negative 0.25 here, so that would be from here to here in this graph, and this variation would be from here to here in that graph. So we did the same analysis in a pair that we thought was not under selection. What we found was exactly what we were expecting, no signal of selection. The only signal of selection was in this pair here, which is the pair that overlaps. And by the way, Maculicauda, the species here on the right, has all well, these two spe species, they have, even though they have similar geographic distribution, they have very different, they occupy very different habitats, 
in the same reef. So you find them, you see them doing a, a, the same dive. In one dive, you see both species. Sometimes they're swimming together side by side. But one feeds on the bottom, feeds on large benthic invertebrates, crustaceans, crabs, little small sea urchins, things like that. That's Maculicauda here. And this other one, it feeds on the water column, feeds up in the plankton. So even though the neutral variation, the molecular clock there tells us that those species, the two pairs were split at about the same time, maybe between three and five million years. These two here are so different that they were classified once in a different genus. And if you look at the morphological differences between them, everything that is different about this guy here that, was, that made people put it in a different genus at one point has to do with adaptations to the pelagic environment. So it has a more elongated body, it has smaller scales, it has finer and smaller spines and rays in the fins. It has a smaller mouth, more gill rakers to filter the, 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 the plankton off the water better. The gill, the gill filaments themselves are longer. So the, all of the morphological differences in this guy have to do with adaptation to the, to the water column and to feed in the water column. Um, and the morphological differences between them are like night and day. And this one, you can't tell them apart. So even though the, the variation, the background neutral variation is about, it's similar between the two of them. So very interesting case. And that is this one is, this is this one that uh, uh, Moises, one of my students, is going to be defending in two weeks? In two weeks, yeah, when I come back from Vanuatu. So on November 21st is his defense date. So hopefully that's, we're already working on submitting it and hopefully it will come out soon. So take home messages from those two data sets. Um, studying speciation only using a few genes, which is what we did in the past. It, it gives useful results, but if you really want to get to the to the root of the question, to, to trying to show exactly what is driving it, you have to look at thousands of loci. Uh, RedSeq is the, is the methodology that we've been using, but there's new methods that come out every day, so I'm probably gonna have to stop saying that one of these days because there's other methodologies out there that we're gonna start trying and then see if they work also. And, uh, and those two data sets, they represent some of the first genomic evidence in support of ecological speciation in fishes, so in support of speciation that is driven by adaptation to their environments instead of just isolation. All right, so for the next 10 minutes or so, I'll talk, I'll talk about some really exciting developments in my, in, in my uh, research, in my lab, uh, which is diving to those depths that nobody ever goes to. Um, it's, it's something that is quite hard to do from my institutional point of view because of the, the liability involved. It's not as, as, I mean, if you guys dive shallow here, you know that you can, we have to file all kinds of types of forms and dive plans and do medical exams. And can you imagine if you're doing deeper? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard from an institutional point of view. And I've never had the support that I needed in any other. I've always wanted to do this. I did, crazily enough, I did it in some deep air dives back in the day when I was in my mid-20s and I thought I couldn't die. Um, uh, but now I don't do that anymore. Only, only extremely safe stuff. But uh, uh, the reasoning for doing that is trying to study this zone here, which uh, popularly known as the twilight zone, but the, the more... Um, scientific term for it is the mesophotic zone of coral reefs. And it has remained understudied and unknown, and it still is for the most part, uh, because using normal scuba gear, you're limited really to the top 130 feet or so. If you want to push it, you can go down to 200 feet, but only for five minutes, and, and uh, it's not good. So I'd say top three, 130 feet, and we do know quite a lot about this, this top area here. And then if you have a submarine, you're paying $25,000 a day, $30,000 a day, you're not gonna mess around between 200 and 500 feet. You're gonna go straight down as deep as the submarine can go, 2,000 meters, 3,000 meters. I wouldn't, if I had $50,000 a day to spend in a submarine, I wouldn't stop at 100 meters. I would go down straight to where the submarine can go. Uh, and the submarine is usually, it's really not the right tool to study this area. So those mosophotic reefs, a lot of people think that there's no structure there. There's, it's like the, seafloor that is very flat, um, but it's not. It's very complex, uh, structurally complex. And that's because if you think 10,000 years ago, the, the sea level was 100 meters lower. And this is where the reef used to grow 10,000 years ago. So the reef grew here 10,000 years ago. The sea level raised those reefs, those corals that were growing here drowned. They, they couldn't grow anymore, but their skeletons are still there. So there's still a lot of structure. So when you come close to this with a submarine, all of the fish go inside the structure and you can't see anything else anymore. 
So trying to sample a mesophotic reefs with a submarine would be like trying to sample the birds of the rainforest with a helicopter. It's the same thing. All the birds go into the trees, you can see one. So it's not the right tool for the job. Um, not to mention it's, it's very expensive. So the, the way we explore those depths is using those closed circuit rebreathers uh, and mixed gas. Uh, so we see if you breathe nitrogen at those depths, it makes you completely drunk. And you don't want to be drunk at, at uh, 300, 400 feet or so because you have to do, uh, make a lot of decisions. So we replace the, the nitrogen the, in the gas that we're, make, that we're uh, uh, breathing with helium to decrease the narcotic effect of the gas. And helium is very expensive, so that's a limiting factor too. So that's where the rebreather comes in. So with the rebreather, with, uh, if I was breathing, uh, if I was using a normal scuba tank, uh, every time I'd breathe in, I'd breathe out, the bubbles come out, that would be helium coming out. And helium is very expensive, so at those depths, every time I exhaled would be $5 out of, uh, of, of helium. So if you think of the, the time of this lecture here, I would be spending, I don't know, hundreds of dollars of helium uh, in a single dive. So what the rebreather does is, so you can see there's two hoses here. This hose, the air comes in, you breathe in, you breathe out. There's, uh, helium is an inert gas, so you don't metabolize it. All of the helium comes out at the exhale, comes back into the system. There's a canister back here that filters the CO2 out. So it removes the CO2. There's a, an electronic head here with a, a three oxygen sensors that monitor the quantity of oxygen in the breathing gas all the time. And then when the oxygen goes below where you want it to be, the, uh, there's a solenoid back here that injects oxygen in the mix as you need it. So it's a very, very efficient machine. And with these two tiny bottles here, we can spend as much as six, seven hours underwater uh, and go as deep as 500 feet or so and just keep breathing the same helium over and over. Uh, so it's complex, but it's, it's the, the most, efficient, most efficient way of, of reaching those depths. And again, this technology, the technology that we, had to, that we have today, wasn't available 10 years ago either. So, I mean, it's, everything is kind of lining up to allow this, this type of research to happen. So when we go to those depths, half of what we collect are new species. Those are all new species that we collected in the Philippines in the past uh, two expeditions that we did there, all collected between 300 and 500 feet or so. Uh, these, for the most part, if you're trained in reef fish taxonomy, you can tell at least their genera. Uh, so they're relatively close to uh, uh, shallow water counterparts. And one of the things that we're doing is, is plugging those so we have already well-resolved phylogeny. So we know the relationships between species of those groups, but only the shallow water species. So what we're doing a lot now is, is plugging. So this is a phylogeny of chromis, this, this genus of denso fishes here. So we, those are the, the deep species, which are represented by the red here. So we are plugging those deep species into the trees that are already published to see if the deep species form their own group and are evolving separately, or if they're offshoots of the shallow, the shallow groups. Now, this is the first group we did it with because we already had a relatively complete phylogeny of the shallow species. So in this case, it seems like every deep species comes out in a different place of the tree. So it seems like it's, it's one species that goes down, colonizes those deep habitats, and because it's so different there, ecologically it adapts and it becomes something different. And then it happens again, and then it happens again. And those three, they, they're all from the same location too in the Philippines. So um, it's, it's probably ecologically different and colonizations from shallow to deep. Now there's other cases of things that are completely off the charts and very different from everything else. This whole genus here of fish, Sakura, is not found shallower than 300 feet or so. And by the way, we have a pair of these. This is the male. The female is a little bit drabber colored than this one, but uh, this is the male, and we have a pair of them in quarantine at the academy, just waiting for it. We have a new exhibit that will open the summer of next year dedicated to these deep reefs. And uh, we collected a lot of these alive to bring back uh, uh, from the Philippines. We brought back in the last expedition. That's one of the main reasons we're going to Vanuatu next week is to collect more live specimens and bring it back to the, the exhibit that will open next summer. So this is one of them that is uh, back in stage, uh, back in the stage, uh, in quarantine, waiting for the new exhibit to open to be transferred to the public floor. Uh, this is the whole family here, Symphysonodontida, doesn't occur shallower than 400 feet or so. So now we're getting into really submarine territory and fishes that we don't even see while diving. Um, this guy, Grammatonotus, this was the first uh, 
specimen of the whole family that was collected by something that was not a submarine or a dredge and was seen by a diver. Was this, this expedition was the first time that anybody saw or collected something from this family. So the, the novelty in those habitats is just incredible. Now, as everything in life, it comes with a price. Uh, and this is the price we pay here. So this is a dive profile. The black line represents the depth. I know you can't see the numbers here, so I'll tell you what the numbers are. But the black line represents the depth. And then the, the, so the vertical axis is depth. And then the horizontal axis is time. Uh, we go down here. So this is 200 feet right here. This is 410 feet. So this was a dive to about 410 feet. Uh, we started collecting fish about here, and then we ended about here. So we went down, we stopped at 370 feet, we took our nets out, we started collecting fish. We chased fish down the slope, we chased fish up the slope, and then we put our nets away, and then we started going up. So that whole thing happened between 11 and 20 minutes into the dive. So we had nine minutes of collecting. And then we had, we go back to here. So that's 20, that's minute 245 here. And then we had 220 minutes of decompression. That's almost six hours, uh, almost four hours of decompression. So the whole dive here was 246 minutes or so. So that's a long time for nine minutes of collecting. But that's the dive where we collected this guy. So in, in nine minutes down there, we, we collected so much novelty that it's just crazy. And, and it's not only fish, uh, by no means not only fish. Um, I, I, I can't tell families apart for nudibranchs, and there was a, a nudibranch expert, Terry Gosliner, that works also at the academy. He was with us in this expedition. So I just started grabbing random nudibranchs as I saw them at the bottom. 50% of them were new species. So everything that we collect at those depths, we collect a rock that we don't see anything in it. We bring it back. Gustav Pauli, another colleague of us from uh, Florida, cracks the rock open. Hey, five new species. <laughs> All right. Um, so here's a little video of one of those dives, and it's going to show you a few interesting things. So first, um, first thing I want you to notice is the water. It's not very clear. That's the Philippines. That's one of those fish that we have alive back in the, the, the backstage there, Aulantius borbonius. It's a really pretty fish. It's never been shown, and it's never been exhibited in a public aquarium before. Um, we have a decompression chamber where we put those fish in, and then we seal it, and then we bring it back to the surface. That's that male sakura. We also have it alive. Um, if I go back a little bit, there, right there. These are fishing lines at 410 feet. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. But that's the male sakura there. That's a, a new species of cardinal fish. Uh, this, all this sediment raining down. I'm going to mention that in a little bit, too. That's a, a new species of Leopropoma, the one that I had in the first slide. That's another new species of Leopropoma. And, and half of those things we don't collect. We see them because we're down there, but we don't collect because we don't have time. So we just concentrate, collect everything we can, and then we shoot back up. Those are that Symphysondodontidae, so the whole family here. It's, this is the shallowest you see any fish of this family. It's about 380, 400 feet or so. Another new species of Leopropoma. So it's, it's novelty after novelty after novelty. That's the same guy there. Um, so this is an interesting numeric representation here. So this is our, uh, these are expeditions. Most of them, the, the, yellow, the white ones, are, uh, were conducted by Richard, Richard Pyle. He's a researcher at the University of Hawaii that does a lot of the same stuff that, uh, that we're doing now at the Academy. And these are the numbers of new species that he collected during those particular expeditions. Uh, so anywhere between 20 and 46 or so. And in the Philippines, we collected about 14 new species. And then you can plot that. You can start doing funny things with the statistics. You can plot that against exploration time. So this is the actual time that we spent at the bottom, not the, the whole time of the dive, like two hours or so. We had all of those 20 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes here and there. And then in the end of the expedition, depending on the number of divers, because we also add by diver, we come up with these hours of exploration. So anywhere between 2.8 and 8.3 hours of exploration. And this is the new species per hour discovery rates that, uh, that we came up with. Uh, and if you look at it closely, that, and that's for fish, it's for vertebrates. So if we started collecting invertebrates, that number would be much, much higher than that. Uh, who cares about invertebrates? Um, so, but if you look at it closely, the, the Philippines is the lowest number by a long shot here. And that's uh, what I wanted to talk about a little bit. So that's 1.7. That's less than half of the lowest number in the rest of the table there. 
So this is what the, those really oceanic South Pacific reefs look like, really blue, clear water. This is Palau here, this is Vanuatu here on the bottom. And this is what the Philippines looked like when we were there. Um, there was a lot of crazy, uncontrolled coastal development going on, deforestation. Um, they were building roads left and right. And uh, when you take a forest down from the coast, the first thing that happens is all that sediment washes off to the, to the beach. And uh, the shallow reef here, it doesn't suffer too much with it because the currents push the sediment away. And they kind of wash the reef constantly. But as you go deeper than 200, 300 feet or so, the current stops. And the sediment just runs down in those mesophotic reefs, in those deeper reefs. And that's why the, the water looked so murky in that, uh, in, the, in that video that I showed you. And there's all that fishing going on there with fishing lines. We saw fishing lines. We saw diapers and plastic bags and things at 500 feet. So you'd imagine that 500 feet would be outside the reach of humans, but it's not. And what's really sad about it is, uh, is that um, for the most part, those deeper reefs, they're not included in the marine protected area. So Philippines is an interesting place. There's other places. So here in the States, most of the marine protected areas are, are big federal protected areas that include a lot of things and they look at what their biologists are saying. In the Philippines, it's mostly fishing reserves and they're very small and they're only in places where fishermen want people to go diving so they can see the fish and they can make money off of the divers that are going into the reserve and they charge a fee for the divers to dive into the reserve because there's more fish there and the divers do want to do that and it's, it's completely fine. I mean, it's, I'm 100% okay with paying $5, $10 to dive in a, in a reserve instead of having fish or have, having the fishermen fish there. But those, nobody dives in those mosophotic reefs. So they're not in those reserves. So they're being hit by the sediments. They're being hit by the fishing. They're being hit by everything. And they're not, for the most part, not protected. There's not a single marine reserve I know of in the Philippines that includes those mesophoric reefs on. So one of the um, aims of this new exhibit that we're developing at the Academy is to raise awareness that to, to, to those reefs, to tell people that they exist, one, and to go back, study them more, and go back to the local communities in the Philippines and elsewhere in the world, and then... Um, and, uh, and, and convince people to include them in their marine protected areas and show that there's diversity there, that it's unknown and, and we're destroying it before we can, uh, we can even get to know it. So, to conclude, right on time, a lot of people helped me with this, I'm not alone. Uh, uh, Michelle was my postdoc that did most of that surgeon fish work. Moises is the PhD student that did a lot of the grunt work. Hudson is another one of the crazy divers that does the, uh, the, the deep diving with me. Eva is my other PhD student here in, in, in Santa Cruz. She's the TA for Giacomo's course this, this year. Iria is a recent postdoc, just started there with me. And then we have support from a whole bunch of people that help us in the field and go diving with us. And, uh, and I'll be glad to take any questions. We don't know. Um, based on the few cases that we already looked at, the, uh, the genetics tells us that they've been at those depths for longer than the, just the last ice age. So they've probably been, been there for hundreds of, hundreds of thousands to millions of years or so. So it seems like, at least in some places, where the sea level goes down, there's enough structure even deeper so they can move up and down the, the, the structure of the reef and follow it deeper. So when the sea level is 100 meters lower, they're not at the surface, they're 100 meters below that. Yeah, so they seem to move up and down, but that's one thing we're trying to find out also. It, it might be the case that they just got there, it might be the case that they, they never left, so don't know. <laughs> yeah? You, you had the graph with yours and Dr. Pyle's work on there. Um, how much, how many other types of systems has this type of technology been used? Or was that just simply the ones because those were reef fish? Um, because all those were oligotrophic tropical systems. Yeah. Galapagos yeah. aren't on there. Yeah. Ascension Islands not on there. There's nobody crazy enough to do it. But is, so is that a is that a, a, a those are probably 
because of Rich's preferences. He started working in the Pacific, and it was a system that he was familiar with. We're doing a lot of work in the Atlantic now, uh, in Curacao. Uh, we just had a paper accepted uh, looking at the fauna in Curacao. And again, just to give you an idea of, of comparing how not effective submarines is, are compared to, to the diving, uh, Carol Baldwin from the Smithsonian, she has a submarine program going in Curacao for the last 10 years, and she described about 10 or 15 species of, from those depths, because the submarine that she uses there is specifically for those depths, and, and she has, it's, it's a smaller type submarine, it's a lot cheaper, it's not the $25,000 day one. And um, she has a lot of support from the local guy that runs the submarine there, so they let her come into the submarine when there's other tourists in the area, and she collects and the tourists are happy to see the science going on, so she doesn't have to pay for the submarine ride. Um, uh, but in 10 years, she described 10 species and, and collected them. And uh, we spent eight days diving there, and we collected all those 10 species in those eight days of diving. So in, in eight days, we collected as much as she did in 10 years with using the submarine. So it's a lot more efficient. And we saw a lot of the species that she was only seeing at 600, 700, 800 feet because there was less structure there. So it was easier for the submarine to see the, the fish. We saw them a lot shallower. We saw Excuse me, we saw some of them at 300 feet or so, 350 feet, that the submarine saw them only at 500, 600 feet, so. So as far as you know, this technology is not being used in some of the less oligotrophic tropical no. systems. Because no. I know, no. for example, Cocos has oligotrophic on one side and eutrophic on the other side, so yeah. at the same depth you would transition it's, between eutrophic. It's never been used in the East Pacific, it's never been used in the Indian Ocean. It's just the whole Indian, Indian Ocean. Is it just money or is it because the murkiness and the... It's just the number of people doing it. Okay. So there's my lab, there's Rich Pyle's lab, there's uh, for fish, that's about it. There's a group in Puerto Rico that is doing very local work in Puerto Rico, but shallower than this. They don't go, usually don't go deeper than 300 feet or so. And then there's a few groups studying uh, fish in Israel, but that's like 10 miles of coastline. They don't go, I wouldn't go, if I was there, I wouldn't go to the other coastlines either. <laughs> <laughs> but they're very limited to their 10 miles of coastline. And um, yeah, it's like half a dozen groups in the world that are doing it. The Hawaii has a very active, group of people doing it, which is the group that Bridge Power is at. But uh, yeah, the paper after paper that comes out, always we talk about the introduction is we should do this more and then elsewhere. So we have, uh, uh, we're fundraising for a big coral reef initiative at the Academy now. And one of the main aims is going to be to conduct about 15 to 20 or so expeditions to those areas that have never been studied before. Uh, from the mesophoric perspective, just to see what's what's going on there. The Indian Ocean is a big on my list. Yeah, I was actually pushing more for the tropical kelp forest, the deep tropical kelp forest um, fauna. Yeah, yeah. Which we also can't see beyond 60 meters, right. and nobody wants to put a submarine in there. So right. It's, again, it's it's locked up, but it's a completely different ecological mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just a plug. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah. Um, I think that was Moses' work with the uh, allopatric species. Yes. Um, <clears throat> they look like the Atlantic, um, the species have one more barrier, the Amazon. Yeah. And so I was curious if you noticed any difference between North we and did. South. We did. We did. Yeah. The, the, uh, if I can go back to the, to the slide there, and I can show that to you in one of the trees. We did. We found a difference in the mitochondrial DNA, which is more or less what would be expected. So yeah, this, this difference here. So that's Venezuela and Brazil. So there's a little difference. And then there's a big difference between the two of them and the Pacific. And in, in the nuclear DNA, which is this three here, there's no difference between Brazil and the Caribbean. But yeah, I mean, things in Brazil over and over are turning out to be different <laughs> because of the Amazon. Yeah. I was going to ask you about the olivaceous reverses story, whether you consider them separate species or they're um, in the process of Diversion. That's an interesting question, and, uh, and uh, I gave this talk about a year ago to, a, uh, at, to the Brazilian Society of Etiology, where there's a lot of taxonomists, and, and they publish every now and then, they publish papers trying to decide what the species is, and I think that's not a good exercise, but anyhow, um, in this case, I think they are species, even though they've been, this looks like they've been separated by just as long as the white one has been separated. Mm -hmm. But in this case, um, 
they fit in a lot of different species concepts. One of them being that not only they are unique from their neutral genetic perspective, but also from the adaptive perspective. So even though they've been separated by as much time as the Hawaiian population has been separated, I wouldn't call the Hawaiian population a different species because there's no adaptive difference between why I'm sure that I could find transplant to the population of Central Pacific um, olivages to Hawaii, they would mate happily and, and do and, and do very well in Hawaii. But if I transplanted one from the Central Pacific to the Marquesas, uh, I'm not even sure if they would mate with the locals, but they wouldn't do as well as they did because the habitat is a lot different. It's a lot different. So I would, I would definitely call the, the Marquesas one a different um, species based on the adaptive potential that's already shown, and that's one of the species concept, one of the many species concepts out there, but one of them happens a lot. I think I have, see I've, I've gotten, people ask me that question so much that I have this, yeah, I have this at the end of the talk, after the questions. That's no, not a unique question, Scott, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a big debate out there, what a species is, and where do you call it, where do you call species, is it here, is it there, is it there, I don't know, so, yeah, so when it's here, nobody, there's a doubt about it. When it's yeah. here, when it's here, nobody has a question about it. When it's here, that's when the gray area is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you were talking about how the Mesa floated reefs, they don't really grow so much because it was just reefs that had previously been in the zone where they could grow and right. not smirch. Right. So are there some sites that are assessed to be more ideal reef structures compared to others that might have a different type of habitat than other reefs, uh, a different host yeah. the community of yeah. reasons, and other reefs have a slightly different structure. Right. We don't know enough to say that yet. Um, it's been so few places that we visited that, and usually, uh, because we don't have ROVs and cameras and things like that, a lot of the times we go down and we can't find a reef. And then we have to spend those four hours coming back without collecting anything. So uh, when we find a, a good reef, what we consider to be a good reef, which is what is the case for that one in the Philippines that I showed the video of, we keep going back to the same location. So one of the things we're trying to do is get one of those open ROVs just to maybe go a week earlier to the expedition and use it to scout the bottom, to find a lot of different topography type reefs to see if they have different, and then dive those reefs afterwards. Because if we do that, it's really inefficient to do it while diving, because if you don't find a reef, you, you miss it. So we only dive in, in places where we kind of almost know that there are reefs there, but it would be nice if we could explore different types of reefs and then see if the diversity changes or the species composition changes between them. All right, let's thank our speaker.